today is Romans 12, verses 9 through 21. And this is going to be the English Standard Version. Starting in verse 9, Paul writes, Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil, hoard fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, but be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If she is thirsty, give her something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. What is love? Almost makes me want to sing. It's a question that we all think of from time to time. There's songs written about it. There's poems and stories. And as a Christian, we could give the pet answer of, well, God is love. But that doesn't really explain what love does, especially to those who don't know him personally. We sometimes do what's called virtue signaling, which is where you do, you say, I will pray for you, but you don't actually go out and help them. Virtue signaling, you put something on Facebook that says you care about all of the homeless people and yet you do nothing. You might even do something like an ice bucket challenge, but put nothing behind it. We do this all instead of showing what true love is. In this time of transition, I think we have an excellent opportunity to examine what genuine love is. Because as we move forward into our new building, as we transition to a new normal with this COVID thing going on and hopefully ending soon, we need to look over all the stuff we've accumulated all the years. We need to look at all the garbage that we have in our basement. And we need to see if it matches up with John's description of love. And if it doesn't, we need to throw it out. We need to take care of this before we move into the next stage of our story. And just as you move, you find those random items you maybe used once, you don't really know why you bought them. We had, in the new church, we have now a whole bunch of Hanukkah supplies. I don't know when we got those. I don't know why we got those, but we have them. We need to figure out what we do with those. <laughs> there we go. We have a purpose for it. Nice, very good. But also in our lives, we need to examine our beliefs and our prejudices and decide what we need to take to the dump. Some of you might remember uh, Noel Rood. The Roods lived here for quite a while. And after a while, they decided he got a job up in Pendleton and they were going to move. And so they had a bunch of stuff in their house. It was packed to the brim with books and stuff and clutter and all sorts of stuff. And so they got a storage place, right? And so they were taking big truckloads to the storage place, right? And after a while, Joan, Noel's wife, says, well, okay, but that storage place doesn't look very big. Where's our old stuff? And Noel said, oh, well, I would send, when we packed up all the truck, I would send one load to the storage place and one load to the dump. One load to the storage place and one load to the dump. Completely at random. Needless to say, she was not too happy with this. And obviously, that's not the way we need to clean house. 
we need to be very judicious in deciding what we keep and what we throw away. In our passage today, Paul discharges a series of rapid-fire extortion exhortations that whiz by, and they don't seem to be that connected, right? But if we look at them a little bit closer, we find out that they're not arbitrary, but loosely tied to what proceeds in Romans 12, 1 through 8. Paul continues to call for the kind of behavior produced by a renewed mind. And that is the proper response to the mercies of God. So first, Paul calls for change. And we're certainly changing here, both in our lives and our corporate lives. But change of itself does no good. We have to change more than our address. We need to change more than our style of worship. The changes we are going through have to affect us from the inside out. And so Paul continues this chapter by describing those changes that must occur in the Christian life. And he describes these changes from the inside out. He starts with the heart, he goes to the congregation, all the way out to the unbelieving world, even to those you think will never be changed. Now, when I was a kid, maybe Hadley's age, Romans 9, verse 12 was one of my favorite Bible passages. My favorite Bible passage wasn't Jesus wept or God so loved the world. It was the passage about if you're nice to people, God will pour burning coals on their head. And that excited me. I liked the idea that I could be nice to people and smile and know that God would get him in the end. I kind of imagined myself as that stereotypical southern grandma who would fake a smile that almost reached her eyes and in her sweetest voice say, oh, bless your heart. All the while imagining the worst happening to the poor idiot before me. Of course, I realized that this interpretation of scripture doesn't hold up to the genuine love preached in the rest of the gospel. But another thing that I enjoyed when I was a child is this book. This book is But No Elephants by Jerry Smath. And I find that some of the most profound theological points can be found in children's books or fables, which is probably one reason why Jesus taught almost entirely in parables. So, let me go ahead and read you a story. For anybody else, and if anybody wants to come and see the pictures, you can come up a little bit closer and, and I can show pictures while I read this book. So here's Grandma Tildy. Now Grandma Tildy lived all alone in this house. She worked hard every day and she had no time for play. But one day a man came to her house. He was selling pets. Would you like to buy a canary bird? Asked the man. Very well, said Grandma Tildy, but no elephants. And Grandma Tildy was cooking stew. The bird wanted to help, so he sang a song for her, and it made Grandma Tildy happy. That night, they sat down to eat the stew together and it tasted better than ever before. The next day, the pet man came again. Would you like to buy a beaver, he asked. Very well, said Grandma Tildy, but no elephants. And Grandma Tildy needed firewood, and so the beaver wanted to help, so he cut the wood with his sharp teeth. That night, they sat in front of a warm fire. Grandma Tildy went shopping, and naturally she met the pet man again. Would you like to buy a turtle, he asked. Very well, she said, but no elephants. Some of you might start seeing the similarities between Grandma Tildy and Danielle. <laughs> and Grandma Tildy was tired. The turtle wanted to help so he carried her home on his back. That night, Grandma Tildy washed the turtle, 
and put him to bed. The next day it rained and the roof started to leak. Then someone knocked on the door. It was you-know-who. That's right. It was the pet man. Would you like to buy a woodpecker, the pet man asked. Very well, said Grandma Tildy. But no elephants. The woodpecker wanted to help. So he nailed the roof down tight, and the dripping stopped. That night they all danced together in the warm, dry house. The days got colder and colder. Grandma Tildy put food in jars for the winter. I don't like the cold, she said. Just then, the pet man appeared. Would you like to buy an elephant? He asked. He's the only animal I have left, and I must leave before it snows. No, no elephant, shouted Grandma. She went back to her work, and the pet man left. But the elephant stayed, and it started to snow, and it kept on snowing and snowing and snowing, and snowing. No elephant, said Grandma Tildy, but the elephant would not go. They could not see the elephant now, but they could hear him crying, and they felt sad. Very well, called Grandma Tildy, you may come in. The elephant was as happy as could be, but the elephant had a problem. He could not get through the door. So they all helped to push him inside. Oh dear, said Grandma Tildy. I hope the floor is strong. This is a very old house. And outside the snow kept falling, but inside the house it was cozy and warm. And everyone hoped winter would go away and spring would come soon. But that night there was a terrible crash elephant had fallen through the floor. We cannot fix this, said Grandma. You will just have to stay there. The winter was long, and soon the firewood was gone. The elephant was always hungry, and he kept eating, and eating, and eating, until all the food was gone. We cannot leave or we will freeze, said Grandma Tildy, and we cannot stay or we will starve. What are we to do? The elephant felt sorry. Then he thought of a way to help. He started to walk. He walked and walked and walked and walked. And when he stopped, they were in a warm, sunny place. And that is where Grandma Tildy and her friends are today, with all their animals and their elephants. I think this story can tell us a lot. Well, let's look at how Grandma Tildy starts. She's all alone. She works all day and has no time to play. But she doesn't complain. She's not seeking any help. She's very self-sufficient. She doesn't need anything or anyone. She can do it on her own. But just like the pet person, sometimes God puts people in our lives for our good and theirs, even if we don't immediately see that advantage. But what elephants do we deny in our lives? Elephants can be people or circumstances. If we look back to our Bible passage, we can see that love applies equally to circumstances and people. In verse 12 we read, Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. That's smashed right between how we treat others and points to the mindset we must have to increase the capacity to show love to others. And while this entire passage in Romans seems to be a random list, as I said earlier, it is an ever-expanding circle. Verse 9 is personal. It starts with me. It talks about the quality of my love. It also mentions hating what is evil, holding tight to what is good. A personal commitment. Then the circle begins to widen. Be kindly affectionate to one another in brotherly love. It goes on to talk about preferring 
one another and being zealous in our service to the Lord. So the circle widens to include others, but it also reaches back to speak of things in our individual lives, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing in prayer. The circle of responsibility gets a little wider, but doesn't lose sight of me. In the third circle, we go beyond the family of God to embrace all people in general, all people and perhaps all animals, blessing them even when they persecute us, rejoicing and weeping together, and considering them as equals and not inferiors. The flip side of the latter injection speaks of personal pride. So again, we find that the circle enlarges to embrace a new category of people, but it still reaches back to the original ones. The final and widest circle in verses 17 through 21 it embraces even those who are personal enemies and tells us how to respond to them. Perhaps those who are prejudiced against, perhaps the elephants in our lives. We learn to live peaceably with all people. As we move forward, as the world changes and our lives are never going to be the same, what are you struggling with? Is your elephant a fear that you won't give up? Is it a group that you cannot help but be prejudiced against? Is there any part of your life that is not 100% committed to God? Are you not loving to your full extent? If you're not, you are missing out on blessings you could be receiving from our Father in heaven. A.L. Huxley, an English novelist and critic, wrote, It doesn't take much of a man to be a Christian. It takes all of him. And Henry Drummond, a Scottish pastor, once said, The entrance fee to God's kingdom is nothing. The annual dues are everything. Our Christian life is a consummate way of living. In our story that we read, Grandma is willing to take in almost any animal, but she drew the line at elephants. Does that sound familiar? We might even sympathize with her and recognize the hardships that she would inevitably endure by taking care of such a large animal. Remember, this isn't some crazy cat lady. She was fine living all alone, working out her own salvation. She didn't need the company of animals, or so she thought when she started. When the opportunity arose, she grudgingly accepted the canary and the beaver then the turtle and the woodpecker. For each of these animals that she took in, she was blessed. The food was better, she was comfortable, warm, and dry. But still, she could not make herself accept the elephant. And when she did finally give in and took pity on that elephant, crying out in the cold snow, Things don't get better for her. Quite the opposite. Things go from bad to worse. The elephant, they stick in the house and it crashes through the floor. And at that point, she probably thought to herself, this is what's wrong with elephants. I should have left them outside. And when the elephant ate all her food, she was understandably proven in her distaste for having a pet elephant. What is your elephant? What are you praying that God never puts in your life? What are you praying that God removes from your life? If you listen more and complain less, you might see your elephant as a blessing in disguise. I once had a call when I was a tech support agent. It was an email, unfortunately, because it got me in trouble. Um, and this person, they asked me a question. And I gave them the instructions. I said, follow these instructions, and you will immediately have good results. This will fix your problem. And they wrote back, and they said, these instructions are for something completely different. This doesn't solve my problem. And I said, if you would stop complaining and just follow the instructions that I'd sent you, your problem would already be solved. And then my manager called me in the office. <laughs> 
and said, that's probably not how you, how you should have done that, even though I was completely correct. If she had just, answer, just followed those instructions, it would have solved her problem. If we follow our scripture reading and our story, we might see that elephant in disguise. We can see the ever-increasing circles of influence. We can find those elephants in our personal lives and then begin to look at the elephants in the congregation. And no, I'm not calling anybody fat. The pet man, or God, offered us this building in a time that we very much needed it. And it had its perks. And it's a nice building. And it's comfortable. And in fact, I think there are definite takeaways from being in this building, at least for me personally. I think we may have grown as a congregation, but I made a friend. The sound man here, we met and we worked out the sound when we first moved in. And then several months later, I got a new job. And I meet one of my new coworkers, and it's the sound man. And we had that immediate connection. He's like, I recognize you. And I said, yeah, I recognize you too. That's weird. What, what church do you go to? And I told him, and he's like, that's my church. And he made a very profound statement only a week after I had started there. And he said, we go to the same church. And we meet in the same building currently. Not anymore, actually, because he's already gone. But he didn't mean we meet in the same building. He meant we belong to the same family of God. And that is something I will stick with, and his friendship is something that will remain. That was partly because we happened to be stuck in the same building. But this building also had its elephants, didn't it? We had issues with the people who met here yesterday, and, and the building, we always find flaws with it. Even when I talked to, to Patrick, the sound guy, he voiced it very well when he vi wished us good luck in our new country church, away from the evil building owners. Because remember, they rented for a long time too, and they know the struggle that we've had. Getting along just with the other people in the building. You're always going to have different wants, different needs, different requirements, different elephants. But I guarantee the new building won't be all unicorns, and beavers and canaries either. There will be elephants that we need to deal with and convert from pests to blessings. We already know that this new church is a little bit smaller than the, what we're used to and it's further away from some folks. There are already concerns about parking and paint colors and where we're going to fit everybody if we ever get to have another potluck. But Grandma's elephant carried her to where she needed to be. Remember, Grandma Tildy did not like the cold. And none of her other animals, although they fit, they fit her immediate needs, they were not able to solve her location problem. Inevitably, winter would have come again and they would have been able to repair the roof and keep her warm inside. But it wasn't a permanent situation. The elephant, as much trouble as it was, was able to carry her forward. God puts elephants in our lives. He puts elephants in our personal lives and in our life together. And those could be blessings if we accept them. Remember, bless those who persecute you. Do not curse them. Because God can take care of them and can convert them. And can help them to turn around and to join our community. God puts elephants in our lives. We need to eliminate our prejudices and accept 
the people and circumstances that we are given. God allows us access to his genuine love. And Paul here describes every aspect of that love. And if you're ever unsure of what love looks like, just reread Paul's writings in Romans. This is an inclusive love that leaves no room for buts, especially elephantine ones. And let us close in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for the opportunities and the people that you've given us in our personal lives and in our congregational life. You love us beyond measure and you allow us to share in that love in your family. Father, we all have something that we say, God, I will do anything but that. Please allow us to get past those prejudices, to accept the blessings you have put in our lives and to bless others with your love. Allow us to always remember what true love is and more importantly, how to share that with the whole world. Because Lord, we love you because you first loved us. And we put all things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.